one is the Lenoplex Center. Dot com. <laughs> and um, so let me see how to get the, the Lenape Center.com and NARF.org, which is Native American Rights Fund. So thank you. That was the first land acknowledgement I've done, and um, um, it's a work in progress. So if you have any suggestions, let me know. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we are about to listen to four distinct voices today. Sean Johnson is a novelist from Philadelphia who is here to work on her third novel. Nancy Bilyeu was a longtime New York City resident who took the plunge into country life about a year ago. <laughs> and it was a plunge. Uh, and she's working on her novel, The Future of Colors, and that's a sequel to her novel, The Blue. Moon Unit Zappa is a New York City native, even though most people associate her with California and sometimes outer space. <laughs> and she's working on her second book, a memoir and love letter to herself. And let me see. Sorry, I lost my track here because I was thinking about her space for a second. <laughs> and, uh, and then we have world traveler and author of the memoir and paleontologist's daughter, Catherine McKenna, who lives right across the street from Birdcliff. So it's amazing all the different places people come to Birdcliff to do their work. And it, I always say people are reading their work because it is a lot of work. <laughs> you know, so so uh, I want to acknowledge that. First up is Nancy Billy. <laughs> so thank you all for coming. It's exciting to do this. Um, oh, hey, <laughs> my friend. It's important. So thank you for coming. And this is, a, this is my first open studio day uh, since we moved here. And I am so pleased to be part of the community of artists and to um, get to know them and the artists and writers. So a tremendous experience. So, I've written five historical novels. They all have an element of suspense, but they're all a woman's story, usually overcoming something really hard to overcome. So I'm going to read from my last published novel. It was published last year, Dreamland. Um, it's set in 1911, so it's kind of not too far away from the founding of Urban. So, um, Urban. so um, this book, Let's see, um, just to give you the background, I based the main character, <clears throat> excuse me, a little bit on Peggy Guggenheim, mm -hmm. who I found out in her early life. She was an heiress, and the Guggenheims were extremely wealthy. Her father was the black sheep of the family, and she had no interest in being a debutante, and she ended up working in an independent bookstore in New York City. So that was very inspiring to me, and I decided to write someone like her, and then to set her loose mostly in Coney Island. So most of the book is set in Korean, but I'm going to read the prologue and then a little bit of chapter one. So the prologue is sort of, just to give you this writer talk, is in the third person. And then the um, first chapter goes into first person point of view, just so when I start saying I and me, what's she doing? Okay, <laughs> read that. Prologue. The Phantom City vanished an hour after midnight. The one million lights of dreamland darkened as they always did, with a clang as loud as a cannon shot, followed by a long, wheezing gush. The rides, the attractions, the sideshows, the restaurants, the dance hall, the entire 15-acre fairground stretching from the canals of Venice to Lilliput, all of it had been shut down for the night. Once they'd thrown the switch on the light panels, it didn't take long for the heat created by the electric bulbs to dissipate, replaced by the cool, salt-flavored ocean breeze. But the smell of the fairground hung on. Nothing could drive away the scent of stale popcorn, roasted peanuts, taffy and cotton candy, fried crab, boiled corn, beer, mingling with the odor of greasy machinery and humans. This was the fragrance of Pony Island, and no one ever forgot it. The customers trudged home, and exhausted park workers stumbled to their narrow beds in their apartment houses in Brooklyn. It was dark and still in the fairgrounds. This was the time when the night police made his rounds. The beach was on his left and Dreamland on his right. The seagulls, his only companions, hopped in the sand. But then, in the moonlight, past the bathing pavilions, he saw two human figures halfway down the sand, 
walking slowly toward the water's edge. It was the silhouette of a man, his arm around the waist of a woman, wearing a long, dark dress that in the moonlight stood out against the white sand. The policeman smiled to himself as the couple sank into the sand. Hadn't he courted his wife the same way? That was 20 years ago. He still looked forward to coming home, taking off his uniform, sliding into bed next to her as she slept. The policeman kept walking, headed toward Luna Park, where shoot the shoots and helter skelter were rendered motionless into the morning. He didn't hear the woman in the sand, a sharp cry. A few minutes later, there was a different noise, a splash in the water, and no one saw the man walk up the beach and onto the promenade alone. Okay, so then chapter one. I've heard it over and over my entire life. You've never had a job, Peggy, so you wouldn't understand. Now, while it may be true that I can't fully comprehend the details of a person's circumstances, it isn't true that I haven't held a job. I have. When I was 20 years old, I went to work every day at Moonrise Bookstore, cramped two-floor shop on East 39th Street, and I was happy. It didn't last, of course. My last day, June 22nd, 1911, passed uneventfully up to 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I worked away at my assigned place, half of a table in the corner of the balcony, going over the orders and the inventory and the publisher catalog. The main floor was for the customers, as well as the novelists, poets, artists, editors, illustrators, who made their way to the shop. Moonrise Bookstore might have been a complete secret, the overwhelming number of people who live in New York City. There was a beacon for the select few who are set afire by new and contrary ideas. Of course, I longed to be on the main floor, but the owner, Mrs. Hamilton Stark, quite sensibly kept me upstairs, unless there was a gap in the staff and she had no choice, which is what happened. Peggy, could you handle the front, called out Sylvie, the assistant manager. It seems unbelievably now, but to descend those narrow stairs and take my place on the main floor of Moonrise Bookstore was as thrilling to me as it would be for a newly cast Ziegfeld girl to sashay across the stage. But I was nervous too. I just wasn't good at practical tasks. My only formal education in three years at the Jacoby School, where I dove deep into the rich, lovely world of novels, poems, plays, but I never learned how to handle a bank draft, calculate change, make a parcel, do an address. This afternoon, I did manage to sell Henry James the Golden Bowl to a very stern-faced matron. It's a massive tome, the sort of book my mother would display, but never read herself. As soon as I completed the purchase, Sylvie materialized before me. Her eyes were wide. Her cheeks were tinged the palest pink. Mrs. Hamilton Stark has left, but G.T. Samuels is here with his editor from Scribner's. My face must have shown blank. You must know G.T. Samuels. He's English. He's written a book caused a tremendous scandal. And that last phrase, Sylvia's voice dropped to a whisper. I'm surprised that any author could start with her. She lived on McDougal Street with another unmarried woman, and they entertained male callers whom their parents never met. I was so envious. Sylvia pleaded with me to take notes as she discussed the plans for a future bookstore with the editor and author. This is Peggy, our new girl, announced Sylvie, guiding me into the office. This is Hamilton Stark's private domain. One man bolted to his feet, clutching a pipe. He was about 40, wearing a pinstripe suit with a shiny forehead. He made noises about the recruits till they were sure getting younger every year. My attention was on the other man, who had not gotten to his feet, which is an unpardonable sin in New York City. He slumped in a chair, coarse red hair sprouted from his scalp, a beard struggling to cover his chin. Most striking was his pallor. He looked like a consumptive priest. G.T. Samuels nodded in my direction very slightly, as if that were a gesture requiring tremendous effort. This was a man who could cause a scandal. I took notes for the next 15 minutes. It was a bit of a losing battle. My handwriting was built for beauty, not for speed. Suddenly, the Scribner's editor stopped talking about the reading and declared it was the perfect moment for a drink. Sylvie so objected, but laughingly, and the next thing I knew, the editor was fumbling in the cabinet behind me saying, I'm sure Mrs. Hamilton Stark wouldn't mind with the ferocity of someone who really had to have that drink. We discovered bottles of gin and vermouth, and with that, well, we're going to have to make martinis. Sylvie darted out to get some ice, which meant I was left alone with these two. After an awkward silence, the editor asked me what I most like to do to fill my time. I know he was expecting to hear something elevated about fiction. But I said, I saw an exhibition of paintings last week that I liked at the Alfred Stieglitz Gallery. Well, yeah, Stieglitz is making a name for himself on 57th Street. Which painting do you like? I said, well, I quite like one by a new artist of a man standing on the street in Manhattan. Of course, when I describe it like that, it sounds ordinary. 
But in New York, the deep pocketed collectors up on Fifth Avenue are interested in only in dead artists. I heard the director of the Metropolitan Museum of Art was nearly fired for producing a Renoir as the artist was alive, although the museum board did come around. <laughs> for those enlightened enough to admire the Impressionists, or at a stretch, the post Impressionists, it was the portraits, the country scenes in Europe, and still lives of rule. To support the work of someone trying to capture a moment on the streets of New York, no one wanted to do that. For the first time, G.T. Samuel spoke to me, saying in his soft English accent, how did you feel when you looked at that particular painting? Clutching my hands behind my back, I said, I suppose it made me feel glad to see someone who was breaking the rules. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's Pride Month, so I thought um, I'd give that a little plug. <laughs> I, mean, I always say I'm really good at being the witch lesbian and everything else is amateur hour. So yeah, I love this month because I'm like, yeah, I'm good at this, let's do it. So, um, so I'd like to thank Birdcliff and the Woodstock Guild for being a beacon uh, for LGBTQIA plus uh, inclusion and supporting, uh, you know, us queer artists so and um you know i uh was gonna re read a poem but i'm gonna have to read it later because i, I forgot the book that it was in and uh, and <laughs> but it's in the other room but i also wanted to mention uh robert lucy's art is all around us right here which is another queer and or gay embrace of whatever we look at things and he's a gay artist uh here at Woodstock at Birdcliff in Woodstock so um thank you for your beautiful art thank you. It's really a lovely place to be right now. We haven't had this art up until yesterday, and Kate said, oh, it, look, it just feels so much better in here. So thank you. Um, next up is Sean Johnson. Thank you. So hi. Um, I wanted, I, I, you know, it's one of my first two books, and then. Um, I figured I would do what I was working on here because I actually managed to finish um, a complete first draft um, while I was here. Um, mm -hmm. so, yeah. Super helpful, it's super productive. Um, so, a little background about the story this is uh, a story like that begins in the 1950s and it follows one African American man as he kind of moves to Vietnam and the HIV epidemic. And so this is uh, uh, one of my favorite characters in the novel, and this is this man's ex-wife. So this is her name is Shone, and this is uh, a chapter in her voice. Um, so Shone didn't become fully herself until her second marriage ended. She didn't realize how ridiculous she was until she did the same thing twice. Most men never, most women never even slept with a gay man. Or if they did, they knew nothing about it. Most women took men at their word and never questioned them or did the wrong kind of math when stories didn't add up. But she had married two gay men, one right after the other. It was downright incestuous when she thought about it. So she didn't like thinking about it all that much. She gave up on marriage, but not men. She liked men just fine, but she asked questions. How would you categorize your sexual orientation? Have you ever slept with a man? In the last five years or so, um, she added other questions. Do you consistently use condoms? Are you, an are you a drug user? Do you have a problem with safe sex practices? Sure, may I had men curse her and leave her sitting alone at restaurants and bars. She had even had a few men throw drinks on her. She didn't need love or companionship, just sex. But just sex now meant knowing entire sexual histories. So she suffered through dinner and lunch and walks through Center City and plays and movies. She read Michael Collins' How to Survive, How to Have Sex in an Epidemic, One Approach, and followed it religiously. Some people put their faith in the Lord. Show may put her faith in condoms and twice a year testing. She sat at a lace covered table at another Italian restaurant. Her dates always took her to Italian restaurants. Sometimes they were small, authentic places in South Philly, where most of the waiters had Italian accents and lived with dark eyes. But most of them were chains, decorated with Italian flags, wax fruit, and big crystal lace. Her date, Ted, opted for one of the authentic restaurants in South Philly. She met him at the gym. She may never had to worry about her weight. If anything, she was too slight. But she wanted to be strong. She wanted the kind of physical presence that intimidated others. 
She wasn't sure if it was possible, but she joined the gym anyway, anyway um, and worked out with the weights. She was the only woman anywhere near the weights. The other woman jogged in the travel or crowded into a moment's classes with awful music, wearing brightly colored leotards, eyeliner, and lip gloss. The free weights were populated by men who took their bodies seriously. They had regimens and diet plans and supplements. They treated the gym like it was their part-time job. They were defined and cut and above all, able-bodied. Shomei had seen too many people in the news and at her job in her neighborhood wasting away. Their bodies were nothing more than skin stretched tight over bone, all angles. Ted's large hands rested on the table. He, had a, he was body filled with big all over, and his skin was polished to golden bronze. When she first saw him powerlifting what looked to be a tunnel weight, she thought, I deserve that. <laughs> and after he finished lifting and was wiping his chest and face with a towel, she went over and asked him for help in her very best on a clueless woman and in a man voice. She knew better. She did. But she couldn't stop it when it worked well, when it worked without fail. The waitress came, no older than 21, reed thin with thick black hair. Can I get you guys a drink while you look at your menu? She tried to hide it by softening her tone, but her working class South Philly neighbor was still in her voice. South Philly, where Italian grandmothers still swept their steps and decorated the front of their houses each holiday. Dazzling, blinking lights and sad knee high statues of Jesus at Christmas. White cardboard bunnies grazing in the windows on big pastel flowers during Easter. American flags on the 4th of July. Shell Bay didn't escape the place and people she came from either. North Philly was still in her voice as well. Sky, her daughter, sounded more like the white girl she went to school with on the main line, where 16-year-olds drove Mercedes to school and ate laxatives of candy. <laughs> Show me his fingers played with a textured tablecloth. I'll have water in the room for now. Ted ordered a beer and an appetizer. When the waitress left, Ted leaned in close. I've been looking forward to this date with you all week. You're just impressed with my chin-ups. He laughed loud and deep. You haven't actually managed to do a chin-up yet. He smelled like Old Spice, the cologne daddy used to wear before the alcohol caught up with him. He began to sweat looking things no amount of Old Spice could hide. I'm getting close, though. Admit it. She raised her right arm and flexed her bicep. Look at your face. I know all when I see it. Ted reached across the table and squeezed her arm. Yeah, I'm in awe. The waitress came back with drinks and appetizers. Um, the girl actively smelled of lemon and spice from a red plate surrounded by salad. <laughs> they finished their dinner. Chomay said, so I was hoping you could continue this date. His pork paws happened to his wet mouth. Really? I was hoping the same. Good, we're on the same page. Looks like it. Shomei finished her wine. She had a pleasant buzz. She hit that alcohol sweet spot right before full on drunkenness. I have some questions before we can proceed. Of course you do, and you probably should. Go for it. Tab was still in the game, yet she cautioned him. Don't take offense. Sometimes this hasn't gone all that well for me, but I have high hopes for you, Ted. He laughed. I appreciate the vote of confidence. She sat up straight and folded her hands on the table. Do you identify as either gay or bisexual? Ted stopped laughing. You serious right now? Yep, super serious. Okay. No, I don't identify as gay or as bisexual. Next question then. Have you ever had sex with a man? Woman, I just said I wasn't. I know. I heard you. But you could have still slept with a man and not think of yourself as gay or bisexual. <sighs> Jesus, I've never slept with or had any kind of sexual experience with a man. Good enough? I think so. You get points for not flipping out. Most men don't react to this well. I can imagine. <laughs> I married two men who cheated on me with other men. I have loved ones ever since. I'm not fucking around with this. Um, fair enough. So I guess you want my whole entire sexual history. I'm straight. I'm not HIV positive. One more question. Are you good with condoms, Ted? Uh, and I'm just going to skip down to the next session. Section. Uh, so, Shomei didn't bring men home even during the weekends and stop as at Gideon's. She didn't want to burn stage about floors with Florida water afterwards. That seemed like a lot of work for a random buck. She wasn't now that good at keeping a clean house either. Her house wasn't exactly dirty, but there was clutter everywhere. Um, clutter comforted her and made her feel like she was messy. Cleaning was one more thing she wasn't willing to do for sex. She had an entire list, no shaved legs, no plucked or waxed anything, and no lingerie. She always drove her own car. She was an in and out kind of girl. She didn't need breakfast or conversation afterwards. Ted lived in my area, old middle upper class neighborhood, upper middle class flats and progressive lights. The sheets were wide and clean and she lined and quiet. She was used to the constant noise and chaos of her, chaos of her block. My area was cold and dead and sterile. 
but there were no track addicts or drug dealers on the corner. She guessed that was a trade off. Ted was waiting for her when she got out of the car. He guided her to the front door with his hand at her lower back. And she liked the weight of his hand. It felt protective, but not stifling. His wraparound porch featured two actual wooden chairs and a table plus a few brightly colored pots with dead flowers. You nervous, he asked, as he opened his front door. I wasn't, but now I am. What kind of man asks a woman that the first time he brings her home? What are you planning to do? She was mostly joking. She didn't think he'd actually hurt her, but she could never be 100% sure. She was willing to take risks for the promise of touch and sometimes even pleasure. Oh, I'm planning to do you. Yeah, that's not going to stop. John, um, it was funny you said the alcohol, she had the alcohol the sweet spot. And I was thinking earlier, I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm so jumpy today. And I realized I'm like, oh, it's like during the day. I usually do meetings at night after I've worn off all my coffee. And so if I seem a little jumpy, <laughs> it's light out. I don't know I have to drink. So, um, all right. Um, oh, I was going to read you a very short poem, so at least here one poem of a queer person at the very least this month. So. Be present. I love, I work, I am unremarkable. Like a small pond off the mass pike, I'm here. This is not a reckoning. It's only me, a neon sign, flickering into noon. <laughs> I feel very grounded when I introduce this person. Um, Moon Unit Zappa, come on up. Thank you. Set this down before. Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to give you guys a choice. Um, do you want to hear something from my? So when I first sent my material into um, Bird Cliff, uh, I didn't have um, my book deal yet. And so now that I have a book deal, I can't read anything from the new material. And so um, I have two options for you. You can read from my book, which is 17.2% autobiographical. That is <laughs> an underestimation. Um, uh, or I could read a standalone essay. Anyone have a preference? Want to hear about John Hughes? Do you want to hear about Sword of My Life? Sword of My Life. <laughs> <laughs> The book then. Okay, so this is um, this is a book called America the Beautiful, about a girl who is uh, the daughter of a famous painter, and uh, her name is America Throne, uh, and uh, so this is a a part in the story where uh, she's been dumped via fax. You're probably too young to remember fax machines <laughs> and thermal paper. It's humiliating to be dumped like that. Not that I know because I made this up, but um, <laughs> I will just uh, read about uh, her coming to terms with it. She's she just found out she needs chocolate desperately. By San Quentin. Twist, twist. That's a quote from the band Corn. Along with my visa, I put a big pile of it on the 7-Eleven counter. Snickers, Mounds, Chocodile, Cadbury Fruit and Nut Bar, Score, Four Chunkies, and 10 Miniature Reese's. I read somewhere that chocolate has some of the same chemical effects on the brain as love. Hello, my fire end, hello, my fire end, chirped a man in a turban with a long woolly beard behind the counter. Why are you crying, pretty girl, you? No tears, my fire end, no tears. Fifteen dollar minimum on credit card, my fire end, he said cheerfully, ignoring my overwhelming sorrow, just like Jasper. What, I said, staring at the Irish cream logo on the cappuccino machine. I knew it didn't taste like it looked. Fifteen dollar minimum on credit card? I looked back at him. He pointed to a handmade sign, black magic marker on taped up yellow legal pad paper turned sideways to prove it. Fine. Fifty dollars worth, I said, slamming a fistful of Milky Ways on the counter. What? Charge me fifty. Fifty dollars worth, I said, maniacally piling more and more candy on the counter. Clark, Mars, peanut regular minutes, a bag of Hershey's Kisses, Hostess cupcakes, a Charleston shoe. Voila, I said, like a top athlete completing a high bar dismount while I clenched in the numbers. That's only thirty-seven eighty. What, I said, leaning in to get a better look at him. I stared hard at how his mustache seemed to come directly out of his nose. It made me wipe my own nose on my sleeve. 
It is true, 3718, my fire auntie said, merrily smiling. <laughs> he was in despicable contrast to me and my chocolate dilemma. See, my fire auntie pointed to the digital numbers on the tiny window display on the top of the machine. See, 3718, I added two bags of chocolate covered mini donuts. He chuckled, that won't do it. <laughs> I had another fistful of Reese's peanut butter cups. Nope, he said gleefully, brown teeth appearing under his nose stash. <laughs> Look, I said, planting both hands firmly on the counter. It wouldn't be too much trouble. Could you just ring up what's here? I slid my credit card a little closer to his stubby fingers. So no vibity? His eyebrows came to a woolly point. I stared at him. No, nope. just ring up what's here. He matched my stare, then turned back to his little cash register and slid my card through the narrow slot along the side. Okay, it is your life. Then he handed it over to me to sign my cyber signature. Any relation, he said, beginning to smile again. What? To the famous important painter writer. What? I said again in utter disbelief. Any relation? Yes, I'm the daughter. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. He looked like a duck in a shooting gallery running from the inside of the hot dog station to the edge of the magazine rack. Why didn't you say, I'm a painter writer too. I am a poet because of your Arabic. He was a genius, genius from heaven above. He points toward heaven above. I noticed a fluorescent bulb needed changing. He reached forward, gesturing wildly. I'm a fan particularly of the deconstructionist phase in the late 80s. From the show The Media, do you know it? How he would name a work, something clever, and then paint the portrait afterward, like that one I love so dearly. Hasty brushstrokes, hyper real colors, reveal an intense yearning for speedy justice. I mean, he was political and sexual and gratuitous and subtle and personal and deep and sad and transcendent and vulnerable, honest and aesthetically pleasing and hard to stomach. And he acted out every emotion while he continued counting on out my father's attributes on his nimble little fingers. This is like a reverse stick up, I thought, as I backed up. <laughs> my arms raised and surrendered. Please, sir, leave me alone, I pleaded with my eyes. He put his hand over his heart. The daughter of Boris Throne, I don't believe it. Then he leaned his elbow on the counter. You know, I read, I, heard, I saw him read his short story, Kent's Tiny Pony, in Carnegie Mellon at Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Sorry, in, at, in, at. Sorry, I am nervous. He was, he became solemn for a moment, almost presidential, then finally managed, original. For a moment, he was speechless. We shared an awkward moment of silence, and before I could ask my goodies, the damn burst. He was crying, wailing, really. There will never be another one like him. <laughs> Definitely, I thought, I'm the sad one, not you. Then, as mysteriously as it began, the crying stopped. He touched the finger to the corners of his eyes, wiped his mustache three times, and then said, hey, what is the brother working on? The brother does music, right? I read about the son named Spoon. This was all a bit too much. He just, well, um, how about yourself? I read somewhere that you're trying some acting. Um, yeah, voiceovers, actually, because I like my privacy. How's that thing going? Terrific. I mean, look at me. Yeah, he said, holding his belly mirthfully. I guess it pays the bills, huh? He pointed to my $40 chocolate squeeze really across the counter, then leaning conspiratorially. What was it like growing up with Boris thrown for a father? It must have been a trip. He took a hit off an invisible marijuana cigarette. Mm -hmm. I looked at him indignantly. Oh, God, he didn't do drugs. No. He made a face like, I'm not buying it. No. 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 I was getting angry. Really, he said, head in all disbelieving tilt. He leaned in close, whispered, you can tell me. That did it. I wanted to shout. Well, my earliest memories are women on all fours posing nude on our kitchen counter while I tried to eat my organic puffed brown rice and apple juice and peas. And of naked men in various yoga postures hanging off my goddamn jungle gym, I couldn't distinguish which ones my dad wasn't fucking. What about this little gym? My father and I never shared a meal together, not even alone once and the one time we were scheduled to have a dinner just the two of us a crazy stalker type fan like you sat came over and my father took pity on him and let him dine with us which is probably why i chose a narcissistic asshole for a boyfriend and why i have no boundaries with a stranger like you instead <laughs> i just smiled politely and said it was nice may I please have my receipt go my fire aunt he said tearing a little yellow slip of paper it is my gift take it a gift to the sad daughter of my mentor. <laughs> he waved me out shouting, goodbye my fire end, goodbye. I sort of half ran and half limped back to my car like a bad guy with a leaking bloody bullet wound away from the red and white and green fluorescent lit tribute to my father at the corner to Hunga and Ventura. I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you.
just the word no stash. <laughs> 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 I've heard a lot of stash. I heard that one, and I work with somebody that was like, you don't know who you are. Don't like that. Um, anyway, that's really funny. Um, and I can't wait for you to read your memoir, and I, I think everybody in this room is going to be looking forward to it, too. Uh, this is why I missed the book. Okay. Well, today is June 19th and it's Juneteenth. And our work is never done, but this year, let's celebrate freedom. So, give a big to actually recognize this all as a holiday. And, uh, and I'd like to recognize technology. I think it's about the long time it took for the truth about an education to get through the Texas and um, and now about uh, how someone can upload information now. And uh, we know all this racist violence has been happening before, but now that we have cell phones and whatnot, we have recordings and we can push justice a little further, though it's very slow. And, um, and because there is always a person of color being denied freedom, justice, and dignity. We need to make it our business to continue the fight. So I just wanted to say that on Juneteenth and hopefully feel it every day. Um, and let's see. Next up is a very good friend and um, someone I love very much, Catherine McKenna. <laughs> Uh, this is my memoir, and it's about growing up with a scientist's father who worked at the Museum of Natural History in New York for 40 years. So I had a lot of experiences with him and adventures, looking for dinosaurs and fossils out west and across the, kind of the world, really. We had a lot of experiences, and I decided to pick out the one um, adventure that we had on the Colorado River. Um, <clears throat> so I'll just read from that. The Mighty Colorado. The 1973 permit allows Dad to run his two Mackenzie dories down the Colorado River for a month. He names the dories the Pris for my mother and Rat Run for me. Most people assume this is a play on river rats and running rapids, which makes perfect sense. However, my nickname forever is Rat Run. It rhymes with Catherine, an iteration of Dad's original nickname for me when I was a kid, Rattalina Wharf Rat. It is then shortened to Rat, which stuck with me throughout high school. Ratrun seems like the perfect female feminine name to give a running, uh, river running boat, right? We also bring along a 10-man rubber raft with oars that we dubbed the USS Pueblo after the ship that was seized by North Korea in 1968. All I can say is, Thank God for the Pueblo. Dad Douglas and a river runner named Jim Garrish from Oregon are going to be the oarsmen. Other guest passengers will include my aunt, Flicka, Dad's museum assistant, Susan Bell, and her husband, Byron Bell. It's <laughs> true. <laughs> a New York architect, Hal France, an opera conductor, Julian Kadish, a graduate student at New York University, mom, Andrew, my brother, and Barbara Waters, another scientist. We load up the dories on one on top of the other at the ranch in Colorado and tow them to Lee's Ferry in Arizona. Mom makes sure we have enough food for our trip. We will have fresh produce for the first week or so. Cabbage lasts a little longer inside the cool boat compartments and stays with us for another week. We drag beer in the river with a rope to keep it cool. Later, we rely on dry food where you just add water. Things like instant rice, freeze-dried potatoes. We also have some, ar some army issue Hershey's chocolate tropical bars that don't melt. Our trip begins and is, is peaceful and serene for the first two weeks. With a sigh of relief, we float easily through the unnamed rack that I flipped in when I was 13. We had did, done another trip in 1969, so this was my second trip down the river. We stop at Basie's Bases Paradise to collect watercress and refill our canteens with clean water. I have no idea how tired I am of cabbage until I savor, savor the fresh green flavor of watercress in my mouth. We graze on it for half an hour, and then after we've had our fill, we shove off downriver. 
We float through the rapids easily on our, in our dories, which are designed for buoyancy. The, the Pueblo rubber wrap brings up the tail of our three boat parade. The motorless dories complement the silence of the canyon, except for the sound of oars cutting through the water. Other times I listen to the soft muffled, muffled sound of human conversation from the other boats, which echoes across the canyon walls. As commercial outfits pass us with their noisy motors running, we sense their envy. Hey, love those dories, they shout at us as they pass us their giant pontoon boats loaded with 25 tourists. We smile and wave back. A little camaraderie is always welcome in this desolate canyon. I still suffer from sweaty palms each time we near, get near a rough rapid. After a while, I don't even bother to get out of the boat. Instead, I just sit there with my life preserver waiting to get this over with. It's very hard for me. I seem to have some kind of post-traumatic rapid stress disorder. My heart pounds and I can't think straight, but my fear miraculously dissipates when we are not negotiating rapids as the sheer beauty of the canyon brings back the peace. River disaster. After an easy and non-eventful first two weeks on the river, we land at Phantom Ranch to restock supplies and welcome new passengers. Hal France, Byron, and Susan Bell are hiking out, and my Aunt Flicka and Barbara Waters hike down the canyon to join us for a second half of the trip. We are a bit behind schedule, and it's already early afternoon. We ask if we can stay at the campground, but even though we have a private permit to run the river, Phantom Ranch will not allow us to stay overnight because we don't have campground reservation. We have no choice but to continue downriver with our new passengers and fresh food. It's a little later in the day than anyone would like. We need to get a move on if we want to find a place to camp. The onset of late afternoon and dark evening comes as a warning. We float downriver towards mile 90.8 to Horn Creek Rapid. There's talk about this rapid and water level, which is, is extremely low this year due to the ongoing battle over hydroelectricity between California and Arizona. Arizona is purposely holding back water behind Glen Canyon Dam, and the volume is something like 3,500 CFS, which is cubic feet per second, instead of the usual 12,000 to 15,000 CFS. Horn Creek Rapid becomes a lot tamer at 30,000 CFS, but at lower CFS, the rapid creates huge waves and unpredictable currents that become one of the most difficult rapids on the Colorado River. At low water level, on a scale between 1 and 10, Horn Rapid becomes a terrible 9. As we near the rapid, the roar becomes more and more audible. We pull onto a small sandy spot. Everyone but me hikes up to the bedrock to survey the rapid. I have to stay behind and wait. The light is now low now, making it different, difficult to read the rapid correctly. Later, someone suggests the view of the rapid was misleading because, because we had to hike up so high to see it. <clears throat> it looked smaller than it really was. In the end, the decision is made to run Horn Rapid because camping is out of the question. The walls of the canyon come straight down to the water and there are no sandbars. We can't line the rapid because of this fact as well. While the others are gone, I sit in the rat run the entire hour, waiting with my life preserver on, sweating and battling my anxiety. I don't have a good feeling about this one. Everyone returns and mom and dad shove off first in the pris. We watch them as they slip over the first lip of the rapid. The drop is so steep that we see the bottom half of their boat. Chris disappears completely into a mass of white water and waves. We never see them come out. An oar shoots straight into the air like an arrow and then falls back down, piercing the river. My heart is pounding. Where the hell did they go? We are up next in the rat run. Douglas is the oarsman and Andrew is fish on in the front, facing the rapid. He hunkers down on his belly so Doug can see where he's going while he pulls hard against the wild current. I'm sitting in the back of the boat. We head for the tongue, which has an edge like a waterfall. Over we go. We come out of the first trough and are shooting up into the air, almost vertically. Jim, who was steering the Pueblo behind us, later told us they were actually airborne. I look up at Andrew, who's hanging like Christ on the cross, his feet literally dangling in the air. We come crashing down and the cockpit fills up with water. 
The boat almost rights itself, but another huge wave slams into us from the left. We almost stabilize, but there's too much water in the cockpit. They say this rapid is a nine, but I decide it's an 11. <laughs> <laughs> the boat slowly folds over clockwise. As the rat run starts, I'm getting nervous reading this myself. <laughs> As the rat running starts to capsize, I jump out to the right to try to clear the wooden dory. I don't want to get caught under the boat like the last time. As it turns over, the side of the dory hits my life preserver across my back, which takes my breath away for a moment. I hang on tightly to the perimeter rope. I can't see either brother. The river current is pulling us towards a giant granite outcrop on the left side of the canyon, and it becomes clear that we are headed straight for it. I brace for impact. I'm just hoping that my brothers are keeping their eyes on the outcrop and aren't crushed between the rock and the dory. The river rams the front of the boat smack into the granite outcrop. I hear a loud smashing sound as the seams bow and crack from the impact. The full force of the river is now pushing against the flat transom from behind, keeping the rat run from moving one way or the other. With the dory stuck this way, the current is so strong on the riverside that it pulls me underwater even with my life preserver on. I'm two feet underwater with my outstretched arm still clinging to the rope, to the other boat. <clears throat> I pull hard to catch some air and then go under again. I remember Gaylord's most urgent warning, never leave the boat. But I think to myself, I know I'm not supposed to leave the boat, but on the other hand, I can't exactly breathe underwater either. <laughs> you know what? This boat is sunk. <laughs> I let go of the rope. I float downstream, catch the eddy on the other side of the granite outcropping, and crawl out. I sit down on the rocks, stunned, shivering. Where are Douglas and Andrew? I know the answer. They're dead. They are both dead. I don't see them anywhere. After some time, Pueblo comes along with Jim and Flicka. He rows hard over to me. I jump into the rat. Your brothers are okay. We flipped over the rat one, and they are coming. They got stuck in the first eddy with a fully loaded boat filled with water. As we wait for Doug and Andrew to appear, Jim relays that as soon as he saw both dories flip one after the other, he changed directions and decided to take the Pueblo a different route through the Morn Rapid, way to the left side, bumping and scraping over rocks in the rubber raft. The buoyant design lines of the dories are not only cosmetic, although they can easily flip in a rapid, they can just as easily be flipped back upright by rocking them one, two, three with an attached foot line or strap. The strap is hooked to one side midway, then two or three people grab the strap, stand on the opposite side to rock and pull the dory, which naturally wants to roll right side up. It's a beautiful thing to watch. Fortunately, Jim has had experience doing this and helping flip the rat run back upright. Finally, Doug and Andrew appear from the waterlogged rat run. Andrew is furiously bailing water from the cockpit, and Doug is rowing towards us. Now it's time. We gather together to go search for Chris and the Chris and my parents. I'm still thinking of fatalities. My brothers survived, but have my parents drowned? After rowing down the river for quite a while, we finally come across mom and dad. They are clinging to a tiny piece of bedrock in the middle of the river, both starry-eyed and in shock. Mom's hand is blown up to the size of a tennis ball. Dad had tried to cross over to the wall of the canyon to find a place to stop, but he wasn't able to do it. Each time he tried, the cold water would sap a little more strength out of him. We flip the pris right side up and then begin to search for a place to stop. Sandbars are far and few between. We are in the sheer bedrock part of the canyon right now. And we don't want to go through another rapid in the condition we're in. We finally pull over to a rocky place with small patches of sand that we can curl up in for the night. As soon as we debark, I'm calm as a cucumber, and I quickly start a fire to get something hot into my parents. They look like drowned rats all right. Taking care of them helps me avoid my own needs. We unload everything from both dories and assess the damage. A lot of the food is wrecked. Just add water. <laughs> a lot of the food is, oh, sorry, instant rice, soggy, saltine crackers. We throw it all away. We try to to salvage the rest by laying it up out on the rocks to dry. We are cramped on the side of the canyon with our gear and food scattered all over the bedrock. The patch of sand that I sleep on is barely long enough for me to stretch out. 
We make do and begin the process of fixing the rat run, which took the worst hit after the granite wall of horn. I am feeling that maybe riding a rubber raft is better than a dory now. At least a rubber raft can bump over rocks. Of course, Run Rapid does nothing to help with my anxiety, which I have been keeping completely to myself. Coming from a family that doesn't make some mistakes, we seem to be making a lot of them. I have my Pentax camera stored in a watertight ammo box and it keeps me alive. I keep telling myself that I'm taking some amazing canyon photos and it's worth the trip to capture them. As I take, I take as many pictures as I can and look forward to seeing them once they're developed. If I survive this trip, that is. I live for my photographs. We repair the cracks and seams and epoxy and fiberglass, and, which takes a while to thoroughly set and dry. The entire time we spend at our makeshift repair campsite, we don't see a soul come down the river. It's as if we're the only people on the planet. It takes us almost three days to recover from our mishap. Finally, the dories are reloaded and we are ready to get back on the river. River disaster too. <laughs> and I'll just stop. <laughs> Moms are sweaty. I'm just like, damn. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to say that out on the porch, uh, there are books for sale. They're only ten dollars a piece. So if you have any gifts or you just want to read some great stuff. Oh, um, I want to give a big thank you to the board of uh, Woodstock Berkeley Catherine McNeil is here, so thank you. <laughs> she and Heather Olson's hard work has been phenomenal, and it's been great uh, being here and uh, doing things here. Uh, I haven't, I feel like it's been stagnant as many people probably feel too, so it kind of is like I've just jumped in and want to do a lot of things here. Um, and thanks to guest artists and residents, director Kate Conroy, she's taking care of our Zoom uh, situation today. And thank you everybody for coming here and being online. And um, after you've donated to a Native American organization, I'd like you to go to uh, woodstockkill.org to keep their program going and keep these historic buildings standing and available to artists. So thank you very much. <laughs> So we'll be refreshed when we stop in about five minutes. Hey, how are you? Good too. 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 Good